you will just steer for it anyway, full steam ahead. Why? Because you want to sink. You gave up. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the planet. Not giving up. Revolution Radio. 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 Take a look around, kid. What do you see? Homes being foreclosed. People working two, three jobs just to put food on the table and still drowning in debt. Don't get me wrong. This country was founded on great ideals and principles. They've all been ruined by the banks. Open your eyes to banks that are robbing you. You know who my favorite president was? Who? Thomas Jefferson. Because he saw all of this coming and tried to stop it. He fought the banks. JFK, too, and they killed him for it. The banking institution is more dangerous than an army, he said. He also said that every generation needs a revolution, Jimmy. The American dream is just that. Just the dream. War is a continuation of politics. Only by other means. Politics is a continuation of economics by other means. This is our bank. This is our war. And this is our plan of attack. Banks have become an essential threat to our democracy. So consider this justice. Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, the number one listener-supported radio station on the Internet. Please help support this station so this battle can continue forward. Revolution Radio! The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Aloha, everyone, and welcome to Stargate to the Cosmos on Revolution Radio at revolution.radio. And I am your host, Gannick here, Lesson, with my co host, Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson, and Kevin Estrella, Karen Patrick, Penny Bradley, and Russell Brinninger are joining us tonight, and we are doing a panel, a very interesting secret space program panel. And Russell wrote earlier, about three hours ago, on Facebook, Trump's Space Force creation is an intriguing development. There's already a good case to be made that a secret space program already exists. Ben Rich, former CEO of Lockheed, stated, we already have the ability to take ET home. Gary McKinnon hacked NASA and found a list of non-terrestrial officers complete with shipping logs. $21 $21 trillion is missing from the Pentagon. In the late 80s, black triangle UFOs were spotted both in Brazil, acknowledged by the head of the Brazilian Air Force, and in Hudson Valley. A huge black triangle craft made an appearance over Phoenix, Arizona in 1997, as acknowledged by former Arizona governor and pilot Fike Symington. Dr. Stephen Greer says the U.S. mastered anti-gravity in 1954. Tom DeLong and his To the Stars Academy wants to build an interstellar craft with publicly fun- publicly donated funds. Testimonies of whist- a multiple whistleblowers say there is in fact a secret space program, an internal faction of whom want to come forward with the mind bo- mind blowing technologies they already have, gained from interactions with extraterrestrials. Even Richard Dolan, a rational historian, says that there may in fact be a breakaway civilization that uses zero-point energy, interdimensional portals, and time travel. So is Trump being used as a tool to bring forward this knowledge, leading to disclosure of 70-year-old clandestine projects? 
The other possibility is that Trump is oblivious to any of this, and his ego just thought it would be cool to dominate space. So we're going to talk about this and the secret space program. And we got a big panel today, so we're going to get uh, started on this first doctor lesson. What would you like to say about today's program? Okay, well, uh, now that I've got some of the smartest people I know on our show, I just want to say I'm, it's the the traumatization that I've witnessed at the border of the United States where babies are taken out of their parents' uh, arms and put with, in a cage is exactly what uh, the Secret Space uh, Program has been doing to children that they kidnap and do this to. And the horror that we can feel that everybody can get because it's being publicized enough is what, you, what I know you're going to feel about what's really going on behind the scenes and we got the people here to uh, tell you about it okay wonderful i'm going to kind of go boy girl boy girl i hope it works out pretty good the next one i'm going to call on is a girl and karen christine patrick hello yeah oh yeah oh, bad connection okay there we go now it's good now it's good okay take it away okay, Good. Oh, no, I I was really thrilled that you got Russell on here. I saw his uh, comment earlier on Facebook, and I've been reading up. It's kind of been a strange day to be both looking at the whole issue with what's happening on the border. I live in a border state here in New Mexico, as well as then turning around and watching this uh, space farce announcement by, by the Trump administration. Um, I'm extremely dubious of this uh, announcement, primarily because I've been working with a, a Ken Johnston Sr. for three years, looking at the NASA, what NASA, how NASA was used to cover up the secret space program, as well as working with my partner, Brett Shepard, who wrote the book Digital Moon on specifically how it, imagery was used in a propaganda kind of way. So, you know, this is not, to me, this is not a step in disclosure. It's a step away from, from it by putting a front, yet another front, on uh, what we already know exists. So that's what I want to say about that. Okay, great. Well, we're just doing a little intro here to check the mics, and then we'll do longer segments. Next up, uh, we're back to a boy. Kevin Estrella, are you with us? Are you there, Kevin? I missed him. Kevin. Sorry. Missed Kevin. Okay, go back. Thank you, Kevin. While we're waiting for Kevin, we will talk to Penny Bradley. Penny, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I had my mic off because it's in the temperature range in Central California where we have to run a swamp cooler, and those things are noisy. So when I'm not well, speaking, we'll I'll it. be off. But um, We will bear it, with it. Yes. it. It does kind of cover up the traffic yeah. on the street outside. So there's that. Um, I've been kind of being overwhelmed with people posting on my wall and in my groups about Trump's declaration. And at this point, I'm looking at it as a way to say we're starting a space program now and it's all clean and pretty and we're just going to sweep the last 80 years under the rug. That, that's my feeling about it. And those of us who have been exposing what's going on, it's been too much of a struggle to get here to let him do that. And but it's very, very, very nice. It's a very nice program. <laughs> well, it's a very nice program, and if they're going to stop all of the atrocities going onward, I would be happy with that. But my, my strong feeling is that the atrocities are going to continue but not be addressed. And we can't allow that, those of us who know about them. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Okay, your mic is working. Let's go and see if we have Russell Grinninger. Russell, did you make it on for tonight's show? Yes, I did. I'm here. And uh, Excellent. I'm listening very carefully because... Uh, 
I agree with the former speaker because, you know, we all know that there is a secret space program that is not being disclosed to the public. And according to the testimony of the whistleblowers, there's a faction within the secret space program that wants public disclosure. And there's another faction that's perfectly happy to keep the technologies all to themselves. They really don't feel like uh, public disclosure is appropriate because there's 7 billion people here and they don't see how all these technologies would fit into the culture at large. So we've got, first of all, Tom DeLong, you know, with all these high level people like Hal Putoff, who I deeply respect as a laser physicist and uh, Louis Elizondo. But the thing that bothers me about it is he's saying that the aliens are bugs and we just need to shoot them down. So that may be a, some sort of psyop. I still hope for the best on the To the Stars Academy that they're knowing that the secret space program exists and that all these technologies already exist. They're kind of doing a facade where they're saying, okay, we're going to use public funds to build an interstellar spacecraft. Well, we already know that they have that capability. So that may be one avenue that is palatable to the public at large when uh, they reveal their discoveries, you know, which have been around for 70 years or more. So <clears throat> you combine Tom DeLong and the To the Stars Academy with, um, you know, what Trump is doing, which is saying, okay, we need to dominate space and, you know, we need a, a sixth military faction that's going to dominate space. Something big is going on underneath the surface of all that. And Hillary Clinton was supposed to be the disclosure president. John Podesta was very much behind public disclosure. He's been interested in the UFO field for a long time, and he, he wants it all out there. Well, she lost the election, but it may just be a matter of timing, that the timing is right, and whoever was elected, they're going to use them as a vehicle to bring this information forward. And I, I hope that that's the case. Um, if it's not the case, then... I'm worried about it because I particularly personally don't like the idea of dominating space, you know, and weaponizing space and all that. And, um, you know, we've already been uh, shooting at UFOs for a long, long time. And I just want a whole different paradigm to come about where we connect with our extraterrestrial visitors and in a peaceful fashion, and we can have some kind of meaningful societal exchange with them, but because way back since Operation Paperclip after World War II and before, there's a small, tiny group of people that have grabbed onto this phenomena for themselves and created a breakaway civilization that they're going to want to hoard it all. And so there's probably a, kind of a societal war within the secret space program factions, the part that wants public disclosure and the part that doesn't. And I'm just hoping that the factions within the secret space program that do want public disclosure can somehow uh, mow down the other factions and bring this into the public domain because uh, I think the planet Earth and humanity that lives on it deserves it. Okay. Are you done? You complete with your train of thought? Yeah. Okay, great. I'm going to pass you on to... Um, I'm going to pass the talking stick to Sasha. Go ahead, Sasha. Take it away and address whatever you want to address. We're going to go around Okay. Robin. It's, uh, yeah. So what we have going, uh, and the evidence is really uh, overwhelming, is mass kidnapping of people from Earth right now that are uh, people that are being enslaved and terrible things uh, are done to them. People are disappearing from the national parks. People are, uh, you know, FEMA camps after New Orleans. There's 4,000 unaccounted for. It goes on and on. There is a crisis of kidnapping and enslavement uh, by these corporate entities uh, in space right now. And it's uh, it's this other stuff about what what the uh, governments you know governments you can always tell when they're uh, lying because their mouths are moving or they're so we know what's happening when you look at evidence and listen, listen to penny you you can get there's something desperately important that we have to do really right now we need peace on this planet 
Agreed. Agreed. Okay, so um, let's see. We probably uh, might want to ask each other questions. So do you have any questions for the panel, Sasha, or any particular things you want us to address in this round? No, uh, go round uh, I would really like Okay, yeah, I would want to hear Penny describing the situation. She knows way more than I do and, and about anyone else I practically that I've talked to. What is really going on in the uh, and, All right. uh, and this stuff I'm talking about slavery? Okay, let's let Penny talk to uh, fill in the gaps for uh, the other members of this panel. So go ahead, Penny. We're passing the talking stick to you. Tell us what's going on from your perspective. Perspective. Okay, I was from the first generation of American kids that were kidnapped to be part of the space program. The space program was not initially American, it was initially German. And we were added in after 1947 when America lost the battle of Operation High Jump in Queen, Maudla, Queen Maud's land, Antarctica. Um, the folks that live down there have been running the world ever since. In a covert manner, they allowed the illusion that everything was fine and dandy for the masses to prevent panic and additional warfare and loss of life and they had good reasons for it they thought but what it means is that since 1947 we've all been living a lie and here it is all these many years later and the truth is coming forward because people like me are remembering what happened to us now when I was when I was still an embryo my mother was abducted and there were changes done to me and so ever since then the black ops have thought I was their property rather than a human being and the changes that were done were to give me psi abilities and the ability to interact with Draco without dying so they thought they had good reasons for that but when I was four, they decided to come get me, and um, they took me to Langley for five years, and they used essentially the same thing as most people today call satanic ritual abuse. Um, and these these were doctors in a lab. They were they were do We had a whole section of children who ranged from three to eight years old <clears throat> when they first got there and we each had a cell and we were known by our cell room number rather than our name and we weren't allowed to interact with each other very much because they didn't want us to form bonds they wanted us to be completely alone so that we would have maximum response to whatever they did to us. And what they did to us was they created altars. Um, Stuart Swerdlow describes it as they intentionally formed a 13 by 13 by 13 cube of altars that they could program however they wanted. And I have no reason to doubt that Langley was doing the same thing, <clears throat> even though I was a generation, you, a generation earlier. Uh, uh, Penny, did, did you, how did you know that you were genetically altered? Did your mother, did you ever have a discussion with your mother about this? Did she remember anything? I, I had uh, the QHHT regression hypnosis. And that was one of the things that I was told definitively was that I had been DNA modified by what what my higher self called military laboratories, which I have since researched and found out that was the prior name of the 
it, it's a branch of CIA. And my family were members of the Christ denomination, which Karen um, backed up in one of the source places. The, Once I got to England, we can't hear you, Penny. Can you talk up? Is that any better? Yeah, I can hear. You. Yes, yes. Not okay, sure what's I, going on, but you were fading in and out. Okay, the mic was too high. Um, so, um, what I what they did was first they spent the first year mind fracturing me and then they spent the other four years training me to use the abilities that they had made sure I had. So um, a year of that time I was taken to Montauk and this was before Al Bellick's, um program. So the, the initial program was boys and girls. And they had enough trouble with girls going interdimensional that they decided to go with just boys after that. Um, the boys didn't do that. So for the girls, it was a way to escape because we were obviously supposed to act, we were supposed to travel through time. And if we had the capability of going elsewhere, that was a way to escape from these people um, because we were in hell. That that's um, I got in so much trouble for going interdimensional that the Draco warrior that was there saved my life from the Scientologists who were running Montauk. Um, they wanted to just dump me in the incinerator like they did the crazy kids. And the Draco said, no, we'll chip her instead. Where, and I will go find her. And he did. But it's otherwise I wouldn't be here today to tell. So those who think that all Draco are, are horrible, you're wrong. They're not. They may have an agenda, but they're not always... They're, they're usually not as bad as the humans I, I dealt with. But um, once I was nine, I was sent to Mars with a group of the other survivors from Langley and we were in we went through the jump gate the same one that that um, Andy Basiago talks about and uh, we were in a group home situation where we had one person who was responsible for all I think there were 20 of us and um, we were introduced to a German Teutonic culture where we were at the bottom of the pile and expected to fight our way to the top. Um, we were not allowed to fight physically in class, but there are ways of showing aggression without f being physical. And... So that particular altar that went through that lifetime is a very aggressive person. And I've reintegrated her is why I have her memories. Now that culture has the German hierarchy is at the top. And they are allied with the Draco. And they're more aggressive than the Draco. Um, underneath them are th your officers who are Schwarze Sonne, which is what Americans call Black Sun. And they drink black goo to get special powers. Uh, it ups their, their IQ. It makes them invincible. It gives them great health. Until one day they're too sick for the black goo to keep them going, and then they'll throw up the black goo and they'll die within hours. It's a really gruesome death. 
but they think it's worth it. And it's, it, the black goo eliminates all empathy that they would have for any other person, human or otherwise. Um, in the space program, we consider the ET allies to be persons. They're just not human persons. Um, what was the next thing? Okay. Below the Schwarzesone are the officers who have not drank the black goo. And below them are the enlisted people. And that that's the bulk of the programs are the enlisted people. These are your boots on the ground. These are your people who are mechanics, who, who fix things, who cook the food, who, who do the communications, who keep everything going. And they... Okay, everything below the Schwarzesone has a chip in their head where that if you do not do what you are supposed to do, they can explode that chip and kill you on the spot. It starts off with a headache and it goes to full seizures and then they kill you. Now, if they want to keep you anyway, they'll t toss you into the regeneration tank which is manted technology, and they can bring you back from the dead. But you'll remember having been killed. Um, so below the enlisted men, you have colonists who are sort of equivalent level as the enlisted men, but not really. They have to... If an enlisted person gives them an order, they have to obey it. And then you have the bulk of the work is done by a combination of still human slaves and cyborgs. The cyborg, cyborgs are robotics with a part of a human brain so that they can operate the ET tech, which requires consciousness. So you have a human being trapped inside a robot body. And it will be trapped there until the robot body is, is completely destroyed and all the brain tissue is dead. And at any time, they can take a, they can take a cell sample of that brain and regrow a human body and put that consciousness back into it. The tech out there is just so unbelievable from Earth human standards that most people have trouble wrapping their heads around it. But the state Penny the state of it yeah, is your most mm -hmm. of the people out there are even the ones that are at the top of the pile are still mind-controlled slaves. Maybe. The only yeah. the only ones that are actually free thinking are the German hierarchy. Everybody else are slaves. And I've I've heard some of my fellow whistleblowers balk at that because they because there's a hierarchy to it. But anything below the top, you're just a slave. You're not there by your free yeah. will. You can't leave when you want. You're not getting paid. You get you get used for however long they want you to. You don't have the option of death because they'll dump you into a regen tank. And it it's what else do you call this? Right, slavery. Let me uh, let me pass the talking to around because that's a lot of information i want everybody to get a chance to address that just bookmark where you are we'll continue the narrative but i want to go around robin here i want to um uh, let russell then karen then back to uh sasha go ahead russell that was a well, lot it's of interesting Every, everything the former speaker said was really interesting to me because it sounds that's like penny. an ai Penny, thank you, sorry. Mm -hmm. And uh, as Penny said, there's uh, a subculture of people that are already tapped into AI with the black goo and uh, alien artificial intelligence. They, 
I've read where they do have the capability of extracting the human soul and putting them in containers or putting them in different bodies. So that matches up. And I'm also very intrigued by the testimony of an early contactee, Albert Bender, who started the uh, National Flying Saucer Bureau, International Flying Saucer Bureau back in 1952, because he, according to his testimony, was taken to Antarctica and introduced to what he called a snake race. And according to him, they were here extracting some type of energy system from uh, Earth's seawater. And in the last year, they just figured out that uranium can be extracted from seawater. So there are um, profound energy supplies that can be extracted from seawater. But I find it really interesting that, you know, he would have said that back in 1952. And as Penny said, uh, Pretty much everybody's on board with the fact that Nazi Germany went to Antarctica and started New Schwabenland, or, you know, they've got a base down there. And this is verified by Operation High Jump. When Admiral Byrd went down there, saucers came up out of the water and, you know, destroyed some of his equipment, some of his airplanes. He came back with his tail between his legs. So there is a uh, Nazi, possibly Nazi slash Draco base in Antarctica. And I was reading where Michael Sala believes that the 1952 flyover in Washington, D.C. were part of that faction down there, that these were Nazi Bellcraft uh, that came up from New Schwabenland just to make a demonstration of power. So, and also David Polite's work, uh, Missing 411, there's approximately 30,000 people a year that go missing. So the idea that they might be somehow kidnapped and recruited into a secret space program operation that's tied into implants and chips and AI, you know, a lot of this may in fact be going on. All right. Karen, your turn. Yes. Hello. Um, yeah, I wanted to read a little short passage here about Werner von Braun. And the reason why is I think this uh, Space Force concept is part of what Carol Rosen identified as the last card, and I have a passage that explains that. Um, and she worked for with Werner von Braun, who was brought over ostensibly to give us rockets in our space program, but he also had some involvement in uh, electrogravitic craft as well. So it's hard to say what, what he was brought over for. But he, towards the end of his life, was, I guess, trying to explain what the plan on the board was, and uh, I'll read this. Uh, von Braun had a history of working with weapon systems. He escaped from Germany to come to this country and become a vice president of Fairchild Industries when I met him, that being Carol Lawson. Von Braun's purpose during the last years of his life, his dying years, was to educate the public and decision makers about why space-based weapons are dumb, dangerous, destabilizing, too costly, unnecessary, unworkable, and undesirable idea, and about the alternatives that are available. As practically a deathbed speech, he educated me about those concepts and who the players were in his game. He gave me the responsibility, since he was dying, of continuing his efforts to prevent the weaponization of outer space. When Werner von Braun was dying of cancer, he asked me to be his spokesperson uh, to appear on occasions when he was too ill to speak. I did this. What was most interesting to me was a repetitive sentence that he said to me over and over during the approximately four years that I had the opportunity to work with them. He said the strategy that was being used to educate the public and decision makers was to use scare tactics. Uh, that was how we identify an enemy. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was first the Russians are going to be considered the enemy. In fact, in 1974, they were the enemy, the identified enemy. Uh, we were told they had killer satellites. We were told that they were coming to get us and control us, that they were commies. Then terrorists would be identified, and that was soon to follow. We heard a lot about terrorism. Then we were going to identify third country, third world country crazies. We now call them nations of concern. But he said that would be the third enemy against whom we would build space-based uh, weapons. The next was asteroids. Now, at this point, he kind of chuckled the first time he said it. Asteroids against asteroids were going to build space-based weapon. And the funniest one of all was what he called aliens uh, extraterrestrial. That would be the final scare. And over and over during the four years that I knew him, he was giving us and uh, giving speeches for him. He would bring up the last card. And remember, Carol, 
the last card is the alien card. We are going to build space-based weapons against aliens, and all of it is a lie. And I, I like to bring that up because there does seem to be a process in order, just um, observing um, the fact that NASA was trying to talk about near-Earth objects or asteroids, and that kind of got scuttled because in the research we've done, basically... Um, uh, one of the congressmen famously asked, well, what happens if an asteroid's heading toward us? Well, they said, well, well, we can tell you it's coming, but we can't stop it. And that kind of scuttled the uh, funding, because it's all about funding, ultimately. It scuttled the funding for the asteroid program, so I guess we're skipping right to the last card in the idea, in my opinion, of a space force. Force against whom? If it's not turned against the people of, you know, of Earth, then who is it turned against? What do we need a space force for? That's my question. So I just wanted to bring up that kind of famous case. <laughs> That's a very good question. <laughs> what do we need a space fleet for if there's no aliens? Okay, whatever. Um, okay, we're we'll back to Sasha. Luck's been said. We're coming up on the top of the first hour. Sasha, what would you oh, like to address? What would you like to add? What would you like? Oh yeah, I just ask? I would really like to hear the next thing, uh, Penny, in your story uh, uh, as your life progressed. And I, I guess what really gets me is that how you found love that really came back to you uh, through all you've been through. That just what blew my mind about your story. I passed to Penny. <clears throat> okay. Um. When I was at Langley, I was in room number seven, and there was a boy a year older than me, give or take, who was in room number five. So we were at Langley together, and then we were shipped to Mars together, and we were, we went through Shula which is the German colony school. And we graduated at about the same time. And he was put into the translation program because he was deeply gifted at that. He, on Earth, he spoke Russian and English. And in space, he, he spoke English, German, and Russian. And, and when... Corey Good talks about his glass pad. This was the person who uploaded most of the information on the glass pads. <clears throat> Funny, my, my altar describes him now as being a, quote, girly man because he was somewhat effeminate. But we had, we had spent all this time together. And I became a fighter pilot in a unit of women fighter pilots. So we were called the Valkyrian. That's the Valkyries in English. And I didn't know what my name was. They had called me Penelope, which is my real name. But they had pronounced it Germanic. And so I adopted the name of my unit as my surname. So... On Mars, I was Penelope Valkyren, and um, because we had known each other since Langley, there was a bond, and um, I don't know if I seduced him or vice versa, but we ended up an item, and in the, in the German fleet, even on Mars, there's this thing that any officer relationship has to be kept extremely discreet. You're not supposed to form a bond. There's not supposed to ever be any trauma. Well, I don't know what they named him there, but on Earth his name was Steve. And we ended up in this long-term affair, and one day I was sent to take out a raptor nest. I should probably state here that there were four other sentient races on Mars when, when the Germans got there. 
And the first thing they did was go to war with two of them. They nuked those those races cities into oblivion sending one of those races into the stone age um what was so, the races what other the races were there okay the ones that we were at war with were the mars native raptors who look just like out of jurassic park except they have human-like arms and they stand a little more upright and they still have the, the six-inch raptor claws. And you look, they're telepathic, and you look them in the eyes, and you know you are dealing with someone smarter than you are. There is no questioning that. Um, they are only in the place they are in because the Germans nuked them. Um, then there are the German... The, the Mars mantids, and they're not, they're a sub race of the mantid empire. Um, they're, they're, they look more like earth mantids than the normal ones do. Like, so they, they have the actual mantis face, like the bug on earth does, but they're not. They're just as intelligent. They don't, they don't speak in words, but they are completely telepathic. And they keep the Mars spiders as pets, like we, pe like we keep dogs. And I would get out of a plane and be supposed to... I would be supposed to capture a mantid for interrogation. And inevitably, I would be eaten by a spider. But um, <clears throat> I I still have it. What well, happens? What your what? Huh? You said you would get eaten by a spider. Then what happened? I would wake up in a regeneration tank. Oh, the regen. So do they re they get you out of its stomach, or do they get you before you're consumed, or how does that work? They would find the dry husk, and they had a tissue sample on on file for me. Um. Oh. The the technology, they put whatever they find into the tank, and they put the tissue sample of what you're supposed to be into. There's a slot in the in the control panel, and they set you for a an age and weight, and depending on how damaged you are, how long it takes. But you come out and you are that age, that fate, in, in perfect shape and matching your DNA file. By the way, that's a way to get the viruses. Well, you're breaking up. That's a way to what? Get rid of viruses or parasites or or diseases. They just put it's you also through. It's a they nice way to... Lose weight. <laughs> Lose weight and regress. You don't, you don't need plastic really, surgery. You don't really have have a weight problem there. Um, the food's not that great, but you get in trouble if you don't eat. And um, you're working constantly. And they keep you at what they consider your optimum age and weight based on mm -hmm. your performance so the whole time the whole time i was there my body appeared to be 30 years old and 160 pounds and that was where they kept me because that's where i functioned the best that mm. to them it's all about your productivity you're not a person they don't care how you feel. They want you productive because you're an asset. You're not a person. And I was a lieutenant. I was an officer. And this is the way they treated me. Also, the drugs they give you to enhance your performance damage your liver. So no matter what you do, you still have to go through some sort of medical treatment once a week or your liver will give out. 
So they have they have to give, basically give you a new liver every week. Wow. That, there are consequences to this tech. Go ahead, Sasha. You're flying in uh, to, uh, to get, wipe out this nest of... Uh, oh, and, back to uh, my story. Yes, yeah. I, was, I was flying in and my plane resembled an F-14. And this would have been in 1990 Earth time. Um, except that it had plasma engines instead of jet engines. And I was flying in, and I had this screen in front of me that a chip in my head provided that showed me what was going on inside the raptor nest. And I found Steve being dinner. And I absolutely panicked. And my ship, because I was chipped to the ship's computer, the ship's computer felt the panic and said oh let's fire everything and it did but it recorded the time coordinates and then it took me home because I was in a flat panic and couldn't even do that and I got into major big trouble and they used the time tech to do what they called redial and they pulled all the humans out of the nest before the weapons. And I got a dressing gown <clears throat> where having an affair, I got blonded for losing control of my emotions in a tactical situation and for no longer being trustworthy to have those kinds of weapons. And they transferred me to off planet. And I had spent 25 years on Mars. And in 1990... Bring the mic closer. Talking to the mic. Okay. In, in 1990, they shipped me into Dark Fleet. And, uh, or as we called it, Nachtwaffen. And, um... I spent another 25 years there on the ship, and they sent me home in that altar in 2014. So the information that I have is, is fresh as of 2014. There was no alliance at that point. There were no rebels. Being a rebel was impossible. You did not even own your own shoes. How were you going to have a ship? Uh, you weren't allowed to think for yourself without a chip in your head. How were you going to, to form a conspiracy to take over a ship? I mean, the people that are saying this is possible could not possibly have been there and experienced the level of my that's there. There is no way that even the ships captain, even if they were Artisana, would have been able to rebel. There is no way. Not not in the journey. It's just not possible. So Kiss the mic. Kiss the mic, sweetie. Can't hear you. So, so if if people are rebelling, it's not from the, the German fleet. But, so, um, the, the, when you told the story the other day, it was how you got free was when the, when the love that was imperishable came through again. That, that's, that was what I got. Oh, yeah. Just, um, when, when I was back on Earth... Um, in 2013, I met Steve, real world, on Earth. And at that point, he was an NSA agent and used my remember code from my programming 
and he's he's the reason that I can remember. But strangely, he did not remember Mars. And one of the last things we talked about was that he thought I was crazy. So, wow. Um, he, he, was, he, was kill, he was killed in December 2016. Uh, you, uh, when you're saying it in that uh, uh, passive way, it sounds like he was murdered. Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, he he died. He was he he died in the, in a hospital the day after a roundtable I was involved in was uploaded to YouTube. Wow. So yes, I feel responsible for his death. Wow. He his big his his act that got him killed. It was so important to him to free you. That's just such power. He was committing uh, suicide so that you could live and be free. It's so beautiful. I'm sorry. I'm I'm crying now. Oh, that's cool. I can dig it, really. So can everybody. All right. Karen or uh, Russell, do you have any comments or feedback? Well, that's got to be the greatest love story I've ever heard. And um, it's really interesting from the standpoint of people like myself that don't have any firsthand experience in this secret space program or all the things going on on Mars and all that. But I've been following the testimonies of, of people uh, like Mark Ralph, who uh, hooked up with a woman who was a psychotherapist, and he suddenly remembered all his experiences and collecting data points like uh, Dr. Michael Stalla between Mark Ralph and Randy Kramer and uh, Corey Good and now Penny. And um, they all seem to coordinate pretty well. But I must say, it's. Uh, it's exciting and disturbing at the same time because from the time I was a kid, I always hoped that if there were extraterrestrials that they would have overcome their desire to engage in war and conflict. And it just seems like there's a lot of it going on out there. And uh, people are being enslaved with microchips and under the control of AI and their souls transferred to, from body to body. And it just, it's, it's a world that, uh, is beyond anything I've ever even contemplated, but my mind is open and I'm listening and it sure does seem to coordinate with one another. So I'm just kind of stunned by it to tell you the truth. Is, um, I have a question. Is that just on this like little subroutine? I heard that this part of um, reality of existence is like a, um, a virtual reality program that's going and it, it really isn't the entire continuum of existence it's just kind of like a subroutine is that true well, is that what do you think are you asking me or penny anybody anybody on the panel well i want to throw something out there i've just read a, a body of material called the zeta primer with a spirit medium named paul hamden and they talk about um, quantum synthetic environments that are created to give people virtual reality experiences to see how they would react under certain circumstances. So the big question in my mind with all of these secret space program whistleblowers is, is this really happening on the real planet Mars or is it a synthetic quantum environment created by extraterrestrials to just see how we would react? And uh, I'm bewildered by that right now. <laughs> okay, next person. Who has a comment? Well, Question. in response to that, I will say the blood's there. 
the blood that's there is real. The bodies are real. You can you can taste and smell the blood when you're shot, or or clawed. Uh, you can you can feel the ionization in the air when when the energy weapons are shot. Uh, when the ship when the ship goes down, you feel it. And whenever you're bit by the spider, all you can feel is, is the burning of the venom. And, and thankfully, that doesn't last long because it kills you fast. Wait, waking up in a region tank, it's dark. You're in this green gel. It might as well be, be a sensory deprivation tank. And there have been plenty of times that I have woke up inside there and just wondered, did they actually let me die this time? Hold that thought. We'll be back after five minutes. See you in five. Radio at freedomslips.com and we'll be right back after this message. In breaking news, a visiting Syrian diplomat reported today that their population is evolving rapidly and advancing into a fifth dimensional consciousness. They are seeking peace with all cosmic cultures, which may mean that the Earth will be asked to join the prestigious Galactic Federation of Light Alliances. Please join Debbie West and Michael Hathaway on Lost Knowledge, Saturdays, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time in Studio A for the latest breaking news on the Star Visitor's peaceful contact and the ongoing project of cleansing the Earth. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. Why am I here? You are the eventuality of an anomaly which, despite my sincerest efforts, I have been unable to eliminate from what is otherwise a harmony of mathematical precision, which has led you inexorably here. You haven't answered my question. The Matrix is older than you know, as you are undoubtedly gathering the anomaly is systemic, creating fluctuations in even the most simplistic equation. Choice. The problem is choice. Right here at Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Be here Wednesday evening at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for Private Eye Matrix Revealed with Monique Lassonde. Hello, my name is Mr. Rowe. I am the host of Reality Extraction. On Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com, I utilize logic, intellect, and magic to methodically autonomize, vivisect, analyze, examine, study, scrutinize, and extract an essence of reality from a fog of illusion and confusion. You can find me on Studio B every Thursday at 1700 hours Pacific Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern. No topic taboo, no subject too strange. I strive to take a neutral standpoint during the dissection of the topic at hand. That's Reality Extraction with Mr. Rowe on Revolution Radio. This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. UFOs to government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. It's a 
imagine. If you glimpsed the future and were frightened by what you saw, what would you do with that information? You would go to who, politicians, captains of industry, and how would you convince them? Data, facts. Good luck. The only facts they won't challenge are the ones that keep the wheels greased and the dollars rolling in. But what if, what if there was a way of skipping the middleman, putting the critical news directly into everyone's head? The probability of widespread annihilation kept going up. The only way to stop it was to show it, to scare people straight. Because what? reasonable human being wouldn't be galvanized by the potential destruction of everything they've ever known or loved. To save civilization, I would show its collapse. But how do you think this vision was received? How do you think people responded to the prospect of imminent doom? They gobbled it up like a chocolate eclair. They didn't fear their demise, they repackaged it can be enjoyed as video games, as TV shows, books, movies, the entire world wholeheartedly embraced the apocalypse and sprinted towards it with gleeful abandon. Meanwhile, Earth was crumbling all around you. You've got simultaneous epidemics of obesity and starvation. Explain that one. Bees and butterflies start to disappear. The glaciers melt, algae blooms all around you. Coal mine canaries are dropping dead, and you won't take the hint! In every moment, there is the possibility of a better future. But you people won't believe it. And because you won't believe it, you won't do what is necessary to make it a reality. So you dwell on this terrible future, and you resign yourselves to it. For one reason, because that future doesn't ask anything of you today. Because that future doesn't ask anything of you today. Yes. Saw the iceberg, warned the Titanic. But you will just steer for it anyway, full steam ahead. Why? Because you want to sink. You gave up. Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com, the number one listener supported radio station on the planet. Not giving up. Revolution Radio. 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 Hello, this is Maggie Rose McGrath of The Conquered Show. And co-host, Marine Corps Map, coming to you on Monday and Tuesdays in Studio A, noon to 2 Eastern. And Studio B on Wednesday nights, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Eastern, with educational, instructional information and situational updates, often with wonderful guests on the current landscape in the U.S. and overseas. This is a go, 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 go. We are with you side to side and back to back. Please join us on Monday through Wednesdays. As well as other hosts and guests here on Revolution Radio. 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 We're not going to take it anymore. That's right. We're not going to take it anymore. We said we're not going to take it anymore. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome back to Stargate to the Cosmos on Revolution Radio at revolution.radio. And I am your host, Janet Carolesson. Janet Carolesson with Dr. Sasha Alex Lesson and the co host, uh, who do we have here? Karen Christine Patrick. Russell Scott Brinegar has dropped off, and we have Penny Bradley. So we're having a great time here. I know Russell is calling in from a park. I can hear the lovely birds in the background. I'm not sure where he lives, what part of the world, but it must be a beautiful day. 
And so, um, before we get back to our show, let's remind everybody to please go over to that donation button on the uh, website, revolution.radio, and make your donation this week. I know, Ahmad, you gave us the numbers, but I like to hear your voice. How you doing, Ahmad? And how are we doing in our goal for uh, this month? Doing great. We got 1739, and we need 2600. So uh, we're doing pretty good. Uh, it ain't too bad. Not too bad. Not too shabby. Okay, great. So, Dr. Lesson, you wanted to talk about, uh, what did you want to talk about this last hour of the show? I know you're fascinated with well, the altar. Interested in, in, but I, I'm really interested, uh, Penny, in what happened uh, in uh, Montauk and, uh, and all kinds of very, very similar things that are going on. Basically, this uh, split of a person into these different sub-personalities and how you have created a system of being able to manage them and uh, and and become the chooser in your life and it's just it's it that is uh and i i think all of us can use use some of the can you, some give, of the, a, that journey. Can you give a little explanation of what a sub personality is from your perspective as a student of doctors how and citra stone and dr how stone studied directly with carl jung and uh from my understanding these are fractions or fractals of oneself that help you they usually develop to help you cope with things but everybody has some sub personality we have our inner um, child adult parent and we have our inner inner child uh, or inner critic which is a very dominant one can you kind of give a little exposition of that from from the traditional psychology point of view and then we'll go into penny's explanation of it from a secret space program yeah. Uh, my lab's point of view. Go ahead, Dr. Lesson. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, the difference is between uh, being able to center yourself and realize you have a variety of, uh, of parts or impulses that, that have to be coordinated, which is part of the maturation process, and everybody's got that, and being traumatically split so that when you're in one sub-self, it's not just a sub-self anymore. It's a, it's an alter. It's another person. And you don't have contact with the other. So it's a big, big difference. And it's, and it's the mind splitting that the Germans uh, used, that they, uh, that they Montauk used on people that's being used to this day to traumatize uh, people. You know, when you see what's happening at the border, that's the same thing. These children are being traumatized and split into alters. Anyway, Penny uh, can explain it a lot better than I because she's. Uh, I'd like to hear your explanation, Penny. <clears throat> what they are trying to accomplish is to separate a part of the mind that has access to all of the DNA abilities and the power of the soul without sharing memory with the rest of the mind. And yes, it becomes a separate person who lives within the same body and head. And they program this fraction to do various things and to be activated by whatever trigger they have chosen in the programming. And it's usually something that won't be used in normal life. Um, they will program a specific altar according to a children's book or a movie or a cartoon series and all of the code words for it will come from that specific um, mythology or words words that they make up related to it um, I've been really responsible about not you not saying what my remember code was because most of us also have booby traps where that if we remember it activates a self-destruct program 
And I don't want to be accidentally activating someone else. I know how traumatic it was for me to suddenly have Penelope Valkyrian's memories rushing in on me in another language, complete with smells and sights and feels, wow. and no, no context for any of it. And I don't want to do that to anyone, anyone else. So I'm trying to be responsible here. But she had, that, pro, that altar had been programmed with Wizard of Oz programming. Now, I have other altars that have been killed in their form that have come up as soul fragments. And that's basically, basically the altar that we know from Mind Fracture is the equivalent of what Native Americans saw, call a, a soul fragment. And you do lose soul to these things. Um, your, your cover personality, the person that your parents think they're raising, loses energy to all of these. So the more of them you reintegrate, the stronger you become as a person and more centered as how Sasha, Dr. Sasha described it. You become more centered because you get more of your soul energy back. What they're doing is they're splitting people up into itty bitty, bitty little pieces that they can use however they want and that the, the person themselves are too fragmented to be able to live a even reasonably normal life. And it, it is crippling. And yes, the same thing is being done on a lower scale to these kids at the border. They're being separated by their parents. They're being held in cages. They're, they're, they have no freedom whatsoever. They've got older kids taking care of infants. You know, none of them know even if their parents are alive, where they are, if they're going to be able to see them again, they're being put in with people that don't speak their language because they're taking all of these kids and shoving them in together. So you have kids that speak Portuguese from Brazil mixed with kids that speak, speak Spanish from Costa Rica, and you might have Somali kids thrown in there too. So um, the, the one thing that you can count on with how they are being treated is that they will have altars. Altars are a survival mechanism. It's when you are hit with trauma so severe that your mind cannot deal with it, it forms a frac it forms a fraction to to store that trauma. And that's why they don't share memory is because your core personality can't handle the memory. So, and humans lose this ability somewhere around 10 years old. So if you're doing the same trauma to an adult, they're not going to form altars. They're going to die. So this, this is why they're doing it to small children. And they started doing it to me in 1959. So this has been going on for a very long time. Um, my understanding is the professional term for assets who have been through this process is disassociatives that's how we are described by the military and we are created on purpose and this is a system-wide problem the the ACIO that was founded by AR Borden and he had it headed it for a long time is the agency who chooses which kids are taken for these black ops. And I recently, uh, I recently read one of his books, and it's supposedly fiction, but he had three or four 
off-the-cuff references to disassociatives where he acted like the attitude was like, well, of course we're going to use disassociatives. You know, like it was nothing. You know, like we had a tattoo or, or a chip in us or something. No, they have destroyed us. We cannot possibly be the person we were born to be because of what they've done to us. And once they do it, they think they own us forever. So, yeah, I'm a little bitter about A.R. Borden right now, and I'm a little bitter about the whole process. I have lots of altars. Um, let me, I, let me inter, uh, interject. Uh, so Karen knew A.R. Borden. You didn't know him personally, but you did you talk to him, Karen? You worked in his group. Oh, have you and, and Penny ever discussed AR? And what was your awareness? Are you there, Karen? Are you on mute? Oh, hi. Here I am. <laughs> I found myself. There you are. Um, yeah, yeah. Wherever you are, there. Wherever you go, there you are. Right. Um, no, I. I want to first state that uh, uh, Penny, uh, my own uh, information, uh, one hundred percent with Pit, what Penny is saying. Um, my own experiences uh, bear this out, uh, memory systems I'm dealing with, trauma systems I'm dealing with. Um, just to add, we came out of the same religion, so you had a cognitive dissonance program going where you had all these things happening to you, and you were in this um, fundamentalist Christian environment where, you know, basically... For if you're female, you're just not supposed to say anything about anything, and uh, and uh, you know so that was part of our shared experience, and we talked about that at Contact in the Desert significantly. And uh, I appreciate Penny so much because she did validate that there was a military-industrial complex incursion into uh, strict authoritarian religion in order to be part of the control mechanism. So your primary personality was on lockdown, uh, it, you know, spiritually in that sense. Um, A.R. Borden is, um, I'm, I'm with Penny on it. I, I appreciate that maybe at the end of his life he felt bad and he, you know, began to find a bunch of people to dump information on, so we otherwise wouldn't have it. Um, and, but I was aware that this, you know, the more I got to know him, and like I said, I never met him in person, but I interacted with him on, on Facebook, um, and was in, uh, uh, like conference calls and such with them, what I call the latter day border nights. And how I define that is it's, it's when he began to share his information, he was seeking out intuitives that he would, you know, give files. So like to, everyone has a smattering of these different files about uh, all of this stuff, life physics principles and many other things. And, um, and so uh, we have a group on Facebook, the writings of A.R. Borden, if anyone's interested. It wasn't just A.R. Borden's writings. There were other people as well um, who went by clandestine names, but they were basically, you, it was basically an effort by physicists, like rogue physicists wanting to study the basic quantum hologram theory type of thing. They called it a life physics. They called it um, the idiomaterial universe. And they were using intuitives, obviously just as well as the tips, uh, to map this thing. So it's a little bit step up from remote viewing because it was more what they call ENS, extension neural sensing, which meant that you kind of put your whole whole self into that environment. And instead of a brief little sketchy thing like you do with remote viewing, you're literally, you know, there pulling out whatever information. Um, but, yes, yeah, these programs, um, you know, we were just like assets under management. And, and I've know from, that's true for myself, I have the memory systems of several either alters or, uh, you know, other people that uh, are my, what I call my multiples. So um, there's my, sort of myself as a whole, multidimensional being that seems to be spread out at least four different personalities, not sub-personalities within myself, but uh, like a constellation, like, like quadruplets that all have some shared uh, memory. So I'm, I'm dealing with that. Um, I want to reiterate uh, the one of the people that has validated this was, was um, Andrew Bushago, who gave me the, I had an interesting Christmas. He came and visited our house Christmas Day of last year and said that he met my multiple uh, uh, 
15 years older than me by the name of Dr. Karen Rose, who worked as the ground crew for the jump room programs in the capacity of a psychic sentinel, psychic tracker. She, her job was to basically get the energy signatures of the people going through this exotic technology of teleportation and time travel and put a database together of each participant and then use that information, I guess it was used by psychic trackers in order to find people and wherever they got lost in time and space. And so I have, uh, it, it was really rev a revelation to me because now a lot of things that I had suspicions of, and uh, I'll be writing about that this winter, uh, now there's a lot of knowledge that I can say, okay, now I know where I got it from. And this person visited me in uh, where I used to live in New Mexico and was witnessed by my partner, Brett, and his daughter, Cheyenne. However, uh, three days after having an extensive conversation with Dr. Rose and a, and a laundry mat, uh, a boring laundry mat, I would have remembered any interesting conversation, but I, I was, uh, there was something called blank slate technology that was applied to me. I completely forgot most of the incident. Um, I'm still working on memory recovery. So, um, that was the term I got, assets under management, assets under management. Psychic, people use for psychic tracking, people use for jump room programs, the monta it, it's extensive. Okay, it's really extensive. But yes, I agree that, um, it has, that, the, you know, sort of the trauma based mind control was essential in creating, uh, an asset. And now we seem to be having a process of mutual remembrance which I think is very interesting because this technology is really good at what it does as far as uh, controlling your perception. And for some reason, we're having either a process where this is going to be all revealed to us through experiencers of all these programs, um, or there's some other, I hope, benevolent force at work that's um, helping all of us to heal this is very traumatic and painful and horrifying. Um, and also to give us uh, some respite in our life, life situations. Because most people I know are um, targeted individuals and go through, uh, you know, hell to keep them on lockdown in their primary perception. Um, and also to bring this information forward. So here we are. And there is a secret space program. It's massive. And this uh, space force concept is to me a space. Are. So, there you go. Karen, um, I wanted to uh, talk to you about altars like Benny's been talking about and Sasha's been talking about. Have you ever identified any altars within you? Apparently you have that Dr. Rose. And so, what is, what is Dr. Rose? Is she an altar? Uh, is she uh, a, a clone? And do you have altars? Well, it's hard to say whether she's a clone or I'm a clone of her, but what I'm picking up is it's a time twinning process. So uh, and if you have the idea of something like yourself is in multiple timelines, um, I, I know I've been cross timelines a couple of times. Um, one timeline I had was terminal, and I was, um, I was a caregiver for multiple family members. That's one of the ways they had me on lockdown was constant caregiver duty, taking care of family members. And I uh, was getting sick myself and realized it, it was my turn. You know, I knew when my various family members were going to go. And, uh, you know, as a caregiver, I had that empathic connection. And I suddenly realized it was my turn. And spiritually, I was coming to terms with it and being okay about it. And I had this day in which physical objects, changed around me and suddenly I was on a trajectory to get out of the situation that was causing so much stress that was going to take me out and then I got like you know brought into a situation where I was not under so much you know heavy fire from archonic activity toward me and I was able to, to do my work now with uh, Brett Collins Shepard and Ken Johnston and with you guys um, I got brought out of that terminal timeline so I I wonder where all that fits in so this is, it might not be like if you think of yourself as a multi-dimensional being of which we all are um this is this goes to a different level than just like a within altar although that's an option too i do have awareness as i do have that um it's also your multi-dimensional self in multiple bodies multiple timelines uh all, you know i've gotten connected with who i am in a lot of different places and 
what was interesting about this particular particular revelation is um, I I have got three eyewitnesses. <laughs> but not just the three, um, not just Ed Bishaga, who I've never really found anything that he's ever said to me too haywire, to be really honest. I've, I've done research on him since 2012, uh, trying to understand, well, even before that, 2010 is when I, or 11 is when I first heard of him. Um, instantly drawn to that story. I got a chance to hear him many, many times ta uh, in, talking. Um, he's like an encyclopedia. I have, uh, believe in the the, the jump room program is true. I think it's part of an interdimensional doorway system. Some races develop ships and fly around of them, and some of them travel from place to place through interdimensional doorways, wormholes, that sort of thing. Um, I have vast knowledge of that. I uh, was writing science fiction stories about it and ended up being like, oh, and then I found out was, you know, various testimonies that this was possible and happening. And I uh, was wondering, like, well, how did I know about it, you know? So obviously I've got some memory traces from other people who know about this stuff. And that's what I'm sorting out. Uh, I'll be trying to write about it in a, in a sort of autobi esoteric autobiographical book this winter, my winter project. Um, but, the, you know, this is the thing is, is these, um, the complexity of this is what boggles my mind. I mean, when you start mapping out um, you're talking about, the, you know, to simplify it, basically, this planet is a syndicate of a pyramidic, like if you go look at a uh, fractal pyramid, look up fractal pyramid on Google and go look at images, and you'll see this pyramid within a pyramid with a pyramid, and there's a, there's a top level. The pyramidion is the top of any pyramid. It's a pyramidion of power. And they've got us, you know, locked into this, this labyrinth of, of a, basically a thought form technology. It, it, it's, it's infused in you. It's reinforced by all these different uh, mind control programs. And uh, uh, people tell me, oh, so and so is mind controlled. Yeah, did, did you watch that on TV? I'm just curious. You know, because it's, you know, it's back to your regular scheduled program. We have this primary consensus reality show, which is given to us by politics, religion, and media. And we're expected to uphold it and believe it. And, you know, that's our primary focus, but there, that may, allows them to do all kinds of things underneath to keep, you know, to utilize humanity as a whole and to utilize this individually if we have particularly skills and talents that they need. So 100% was what Penny's saying. Absolutely. Cool. Okay. Uh, who wants a talking stick? So oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I, I was uh, struck. Uh, thank you, Karen. That was really cool. I want to, but I and I am also stuck back at uh, at, at the sort of the, you, you, the, uh, the agony or the uh, anger that uh, you resentment that you still uh, held um, for um, you being kidnapped and enslaved and uh, treated the way you were treated and the stuff they did to your body. And it's like like all all of that. And I and I just wonder, you know. Uh, and then somehow that that stopped you from being the psychic fingerprint of who you were meant to be in a less adverse uh, situation. And yet, and yet, and yet, uh, the evil that you face is what has uh, uh, given your direction. And it makes you a, a power uh, that you really are right now in the situation. And imagine, I do imagine, that you created it for yourself somehow, that a higher you somehow gave you this so that you can, uh, I, I've, I hear such wisdom from you, somehow that you could come back and talk to us like this, uh, Benny. So I think it was, it was good for the rest of us anyhow, even if it hurts you still, I got it. Well, yeah, it is, it is painful. The memories came back all at once from one altar, and since then I have reintegrated 30 of them. And they each have a different but similar story. And I've, I've generally only been talking about Valkyrian because so many people are having so much trouble believing just the one. Um, I recently came forward with a friend that I serve under on his ship because 
he was afraid nobody would believe him. And um, he had to come forward anonymously because in his country, they take your kids away if you talk about abduction experiences. And um, that was a really traumatic experience because on that ship, we had recently had to defend from a piracy attempt. There was a crew that came on board and tried to steal our ship, and we had to kill people. And that was just part of the day's job. You had to defend you had to defend the assets of the people that own you, including each other and the ship. And if it meant killing people, well, that was part of the job. So here we are, both on Earth, dealing with the memory of this incident that we did not physically take part in, but yet we were consciously there. Um, this, this is... This is the norm now before I used to would have been before the remember code was used on me I would have thought well I just had a really bad nightmare but now it's like I know it's real I have to deal with how that part of me responded to this situation um, I have to look at the moral implications of what that part of me did because my soul as a whole is responsible for that even though that particular altar is under serious mind control and you get to a point where it's like you're awake enough to know this is happening but you're not awake enough to be able to stop it and the best I can do to stop it is make the public aware that their tax dollars are paying for this to be done to people. Their tax dollars are enabling a government that does this to its citizens on an ongoing basis and has, ha has been since the 1950s. This is some, and now we have a president who says, oh, gee, we're going to have a space force because I want to be a space power. And you think, so what's he going to do about all the kids that were tortured like I was? Is he going to write us off like we didn't exist? What, what about all the kids all over the world? Because I know people that their children have been taken from from them and are in these real world they stopped putting you in Langley in the 80s because they found out that my generation went insane so now they take them away from their parents or they they abduct them at night and I have I have a friend in Australia that has two, two little kids they're five and eight get up in the morning and tell him what they did in in secret spy school the night before. You know, we have to live with this on a day-to-day -day basis. And for a person who is totally unaware, it sounds like we're crazy. And I understand that. That's why, the, that's why they came up with the theory that it was all just a virtual reality game was so people wouldn't believe us. It makes it where, oh, you're just playing virtual reality. You're LARPing, which is, which is live action role play. No, we're not. We're telling you our truth. We're telling you our honest experience on a day-to-day, all-the-time basis. We don't get to escape from this. So it to me this isn't this isn't something that I'm coming on here to be famous or get attention. This is I want this crap stopped. 
why are they still traumatizing little kids? Whether it whether it's immigrant kids on the border or or members of my family that have been abducted because I know my granddaughter has. Um, I know that at least two of my kids have because they have we have talked about the memories. I know that the other son is involved in a fundamentalist, authoritative, religious cult, just like I was raised in. It's a different one, but it's just like it. And I keep telling him, you're in a cult, you're in a cult, you're in a cult, and nothing gets through. This is the shared experience of the people that have survived the secret space programs and related black ops. You have super soldiers in Kruger and Monarch. You have people who have been through Earth Defense Force, Solar Warden, Nachtwaffen, um, the Japanese version of Nachtwaffen, and however many else there are out there. The, the group that that I'm an admin in, we've been trying to map the programs that are involved on the on the testimony of the survivors. And there are there are at least two hundred projects that have gone on mostly in the nineteen eighties to, to two thousand. Because that's the age range of our members. So we're looking at this and we're saying this is horrific. And we have people who range from the guy who guards the ship while everybody else is out doing their thing to the slave that loaded the ship to I was a navigator on a ship. I was the one that, that plotted the course and watched out for the space critters that eat the energy from the engines. And, you know, we have... A, we have representatives of all of it and they're watching me to see how I'm treated before they go public but we have 3,400 members and at least half of them are actually veterans waiting to see how the whistleblowers are going to be treated because there are real life consequences to this I've been shot with energy weapons 10 times in the two years I've been public, there are consequences. This is they, they owe you some money. They owe you some back pay. They owe me a hell of a lot of back pay. I just one altar was working for them for fifty-five years, and I have integrated thirty altars. Think about how old my soul thinks it is in this incarnation. And that's not even a thumbnail of what I have. Because if they've done the 13 by 13 by 13 cube on me, I have over 2,000 altars. I have no clue what most of them are doing. There are six that I wake up in that I haven't integrated. And two of them are not Nachtwaffen. One is a pilot of a shuttle ship in Kruger, which is a super soldier organ mercenary company that operates in space. Um, the rest are on Earth working for the CIA. And that's probably the scariest part is that they are using the SSP people on Earth for black ops so you know there are going to be people out there who will recognize me from that because some of them are using my body just a different altar others are using clones that look like me because it's easier to transfer your consciousness into a clone and while we're talking about clones there is a theory out there that clones are just nothings. 
clones are no different than your identical twin that has not been allowed to develop its own mind. They're not soulless. They are people in their own right. And they are basically using my altar to possess my twin. And if that's not wrong, I don't know what it is. Rant over. Great rant. Great rant. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's about the uh, quarter, yeah, almost quarter about, till the top yeah, of the hour. What about the the second hour. Well, hear Janet's- you know, I did, I did a lot of extensive uh, therapy and... Um, I would split into at least 17, but we didn't continue to identify them. I realized I was a shapeshifter because my life wasn't safe. So I had a very volatile mother who tried to kill me repeatedly. Um, I was home alone with her. There was five years between me and my next sibling. My father, a typical father of the 50s, was a mailman, and he left <coughs> at the crack of dawn to go deliver mail. Excuse me. And uh, so there was a lot of time that mom was home alone with me. And she did a lot of the typical things like drowned me. And uh, uh, I I can't remember everything she did, but there were just a lot of things that she did to uh, split me. I think my mother was second generation. I think she was split. Um, My grandfathers on both sides were part of the Masons. There was an interdimensional portal in my house, and one another access in the neighbor's backyard. And um, we would see different beings come through the portals. My bedroom was a portal. I would be visited repeatedly by thousands of different beings over the course of time, and, and some discarnate, some family members. So it was just like a a highway of beings coming. So I split uh, partially because I had my reality, which was very interdimensional, and the one that I had to um, exist in, which was, you can't say those things. If you say those things, you get shamed. Uh, if you say those things, your mothers will kill you. So I had to, I had a lot of secrets, a lot of secrets. So when I met Dr. Lesson in 1997, I had gone through many years of talk therapy, some hypnotherapy, regression, mostly in the past lives. Uh, there was there were not a lot of people that would talk about extraterrestrials. And we're talking about in the 80s and 90s and early part of the 21st century. Not a lot of people would talk about extraterrestrials. So we're doing some good work now because this is coming out. But that whole process in of itself of not being able to talk, that you always have careful what you say, uh, never knowing when it's safe to share those things, that creates splits in your psyche. So in 1997, when I met Dr. Lesson, how do you tell your um, partner, your beloved, that you've been abducted by aliens? So I left a book called The Gods of Eden on the back of his toilet. And then one day he came out and he says, is there are there more books like this? And I said, yes. So we headed down to the bookstore. I appealed to his um, uh, anthropology background and his intelligence, and he was a book reader, avid book, book reader, and a nerd, and he could absorb five, six books in a week and understand them <laughs> and be able to talk intelligently about them. So uh, we went down, and a lot of people, we have to start with the um, things that, that reach and activate their logic, and then they can gradually open and expand and accept more. And also, Dr. Lesson was a psychotherapist. So we started doing um, soul retrieval, pieces of my soul, uh, however you symbol it, it's all, it's all good to me, uh, to reintegrate me so that I could uh, you know, be able to function, be more and more high function. So Dr. Lesson, what was it like when you met little Janie, Fanny? <laughs> I was 43-year-old Janet, I'm 64 now. What was that like 21 years ago when you met this poor, poor frightened soul? Like, didn't know who to talk to. 
I, I think you've done a really good job. Uh, you've you've made a really good job of integrating yourself, and uh, uh, you're you're fully empowered. And uh, I'm just in awe of uh, the way you uh, are benefiting uh, humanity with your work. And uh, good good job, Sasha. You you, you help you help this chick. She came along. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. So, but uh, you know, unfortunately, the planet doesn't. Most people on the planet don't have a doctor lesson. That comes along and takes an interest in them and helps to integrate the lost parts of their soul. So uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here to help all these people because I, you know, it's, it's not totally altruistic. I'm just sick and tired of a planet that's gone crazy that doesn't treat people right. I, I, you know, I can't escape it. I have to see it. And it's like, um, let's usher in this new age where every soul is respected. Life is respected. The planet is respected. So that's what I'm about. Anyway, I've been on the hot seat long enough. Unless anybody has any questions, I'm going to yield the hot seat. Just uh, you know, uh, uh, every every life is worth living. Every song is to be sung. Every gift is forgiving. It's the same for everyone. And so you know, this is it right now. Now is the time uh, for for us to really just live from our hearts, and to embrace uh, uh, other consciousnesses as not distant, not enemy, but it's part of a bigger learning process. That's what I get, anyhow. Okay. Did you have a question, Penny? Um, I was going to add that my father had behaved much like your mother, and. I didn't find a psychiatrist, but I did find a shaman, and uh, mm-hmm. that that's the man I live with now. Uh, we've been living together for 18 years, so um, I do have someone helping me find my sane center, so. Wonderful. Karen, who helped you? Who helped you reintegrate your soul um, I, and all this? I have- yeah, I have to give some credit to, I have some benevolent guides, I have some ancestors, when I just simply did not have any other human beings around me that could really help me. Um, my mother's a psychic, so i got to give her some credit for listening to what I'm saying. She, uh, hit, you know, she she's psychic too and was trying to figure out things about me and, and, and believes many things that I say. And my partner, Brett, is phenomenal. He's a program kid just like me. So we have many discussions to try to sort it out and uh, what does it all mean. And I think uh, spiritually, I think we have a higher self or, or, uh, that is watching out for us. And, and we can reach that. Uh, recognize that and integration is the key and, and um, a little alien told me one time integration is integrate intergratitude all of this stuff is compartmentalization and splitting off within and without but entering grace is just you know you make mistakes bad things happen you can't fix everything gratitude is you are you are grateful for all of who you are and who you've become because the people in this discussion are tough cookies, and I, I think the experiences of why we're so determined to to share these ideas in the face of ridicule, in the face of rejection from family and friends, in the in the face of a, the sort of like ufology paranormal genre, uh, putting us to the side and letting you know people talk about the secret space program um, authoritatively as if they know something. And people that actually were in it or were selling T-shirts and you know who you are. So, <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, we this is this is going to come out. I'm sorry, it's going to come out. There, it must be part of our human experience collectively because we literally, I don't think, can go forward without all of the parts of humanity coming together. So I appreciate each and every one of you for your courage, really. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got about five or six minutes. What would the, who wants to cover what before we run out of time? Tell us about the conference that you're going to be putting on, Janet. Well, 
everybody here is coming to the Stargate to the Cosmos conference in October, October 25th to 28th at the MCM Elegante, Elegante Hotel in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we're doing something a little bit different. This is a movement. Uh, this is advocacy. We're here, like the people with Me Too and all these other movements that have sprung up the last two or three years, um, to create this authentic disclosure. Right now, it seems like the narrative is being taken in different, direct, different directions. And, um, and it seems like it's a little bit more of the same old, same old, with the people at the top that have lots of money, that can do fancy things, take the narrative, take it down to that direction, and yet another rock star is born. And this time they're the UFO rock stars, and so, and I, I'm not bad rapping anybody. I think it's wonderful if you, you know, earn money doing this, you accomplish a bit of fame. I think everybody is doing their piece and, and contributing to this evolution of consciousness and the grand awakening. And yet, I, I listen to people like Penny Bradley and all these people that come on my show, and I'm very grateful for each and every one of them to. They're such brave, bold people, you know, they're they're not, you know, gaining any wealth from this and things out in their lives that aren't so good from this, but they're behind truth, authentic truth, and the truth getting out there, which will ultimately, when we get to the bottom of all this, end slavery, that we have many, many generations going back since the, to the creation of humanity, and its um, hybridization program here on the earth and probably beyond to an ancient time that we don't even remember but many many generations where we're not really free and that freedom is just a myth an illusion a, a concept a program and those who wake up discover oh my goodness i'm just a slave and, and the, the awakening happens on so many levels i i started to get aware of it when i was spending an hour a day, morning, getting ready for work, an hour to an hour to have getting to work, the eight hours that I did work, the hour for lunch, another hour to hour and a half getting home, and I spent all my money buying clothes to go to work so I could buy clothes to go to work. And I just was in this hamster wheel, and I didn't get anywhere. There was a, the little dangling carrot that's if you work really hard all of your life, you know, you'll be able to retire, but, you know, but don't worry about it because you can't really retire because they're going to take your Social Security and all your Medicare and Medicaid. Well, here we are. <laughs> I'm 64, retired, and those predictions that I heard, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago were like, for me true. Ah! So um, I'm inviting everybody to participate to get off this hamster wheel to come to the conference to skype into the conference if you can't come and appear for the 90 minute slots that i have you know just call in for five minutes just call in and show your face maybe you can send a recording to me audio or visual and i will play these and basically say me too me too I have had experiences. I've seen things out of the box. I've been a part of the secret space program. And I don't care who you are. Um, you're all important to me. I think everybody is equally as important as each other, although some people think they're more equal than others. So um, it's Stargate to the Cosmos, October 25th to 28th. is an advocacy movement, much like we got Star Trek back on the air, like we ended the Vietnam War, like we brought down the Berlin Wall, and like all the other, you know, women's suffrage movement, all the other advocacy programs, and and entering slavery, uh, civil rights, human rights, like the march goes on and on and on, and we're not done marching till it's over, and we've accomplished authentic truth, authentic disclosure, and true freedom for every soul and every race and every type of being across the cosmos. Thank you very much. I'm getting off my pulpit. Next person. Oh, we have, we're out of time. Okay. Uh, Karen Penny, how do we reach you? Good. Websites? 
Oh, yeah, I'll say uh, my website is the new one. It's caseypatrick.com. It's got my two books, The Anunnaki and the Moon. Um, and also, Weird Shouldn't Starve about the basic income, really allowing free speech for fringe topics and whistleblowers. And that website's going to have some more soon. So, And I'm excited about the conference because we're really going to have um, – you know, authentic voices. I think I'm super excited about the conference in Albuquerque. Stargate to the cosmos.com, right? It's dot org, but uh, dot com will take you there, I think. Okay, and Penny, your Facebook pages, website? Um, I have a website that we recently built. It's spaceportals.net, and it is set up as a social media site. Um, we're still having trouble hooking up uh, PDF files to it, but um, we decided, well, Ian and I decided that we were going to have a, a, a place. <laughs> Excellent. We'll talk about that and more. Thank you very much for joining us today. Aloha and love and blessings. Com. Any commercial advertising you may hear in this program is of the sole discretion and benefit of the host of whose program you are listening to. Revolution Radio does not endorse any commercial products, nor does it accept monetary compensation for on-air advertising of commercial products, nor will it ever. We are and shall remain 100% listener supported. Any product advertising on this program are considered used at higher risk, and Revolution Radio shall not be held liable for any claims or damages received from any product advertised within this program. Revolution Radio, where information never sleeps. Let's imagine. If you glimpsed the future, you were frightened by what you saw, what would you do with that information? You would go to... Oh, politicians, captains of industry, and how would you convince them? Data, facts. Good luck. The only facts they won't challenge are the ones that keep the wheels greased and the dollars rolling in. But what if, what if there was a way of skipping the middleman, putting the critical news directly into everyone's head? The probability of widespread annihilation kept going up. The only way to stop it to show it, to scare people straight. Because what reasonable human being wouldn't be galvanized by the potential destruction of everything they've ever known or loved? To save civilization, I would show its collapse. How do you think this vision was received? How do you think people responded to the prospect of imminent doom? They gobbled it up like a chocolate eclair. They didn't fear their demise.